Hello, let's today spend some time talking about 2 Corinthians. And hopefully you were able to check out the previous video on 1 Corinthians. A lot of things we didn't cover in there, um, particularly around some cultural issues like head covering and more details about worship and the resurrection piece in chapter 15. Um, yet, let's dive into 2 Corinthians, one of my favorite uh, places in the Bible, because it focuses on um, something that is very cross-cultural or uh, counter-cultural. And let me start with a story. So this is my um, goddaughter, Laura Abigail Miller. And when Laura was born, uh, everything seemed kind of right and good and wonderful. And about six, seven months into Laura's journey, she started developing or not developing in the ways that uh, were kind of seen as kind of milestones. And over the next couple of years, when all the other children Laura's age were accomplishing certain things like talking and walking and eating and feeding themselves and all this kind of stuff, Laura did not meet those milestones. And in that, uh, Laura was diagnosed with a very rare genetic condition called Galloway Moat, which is actually the shrinking of the back part of your brain, which limits her engagement or, or control of her movements. So in Laura's life, she could never feed herself, um, walk, talk, really have any kind of control over her movements of her body. And ultimately in March of 2012, uh, Laura ultimately died and uh, just a painful, long process. But of course, in her life, so many beautiful, wonderful things. Laura was able with assistance to go to school and be supported. And um, But in that, the reason why I highlight Laura's story, just to tell you one thing, when Laura died at her funeral, there were lots of different people that gathered, and a couple of people that had come, some of her physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses had come, and when I was talking with one of the nurses about why she came, she shared this with me. She said, when I was with Laura, I felt like I could be completely myself. There was no judgment. Um, Laura didn't have any expectations of me. I was simply allowed to be who I am, and when Laura died, she had a very big funeral. There was two, 300 people there. And what I realized was that Laura had more people come to her funeral than I, I would. And I've got this title and these degrees and blah, 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 right? And then it hit me. What Laura brings to the space, which is profound, complete weakness, vulnerability. There's no domination. There is actual real power in weakness and vulnerability. Catch that line. There is real power and weakness and vulnerability. That's the message of 2 Corinthians. So as you're taking notes today, I want you to say 2 Corinthians, power and weakness, power and vulnerability. The author, of course, is St. Paul, and this is his second correspondence with the community that he's been writing with in Corinth. And why is he writing? Well, the people are suffering. And he wants to show that he is a companion in their suffering. He's also writing to bring about reconciliation because in 1 Corinthians, we knew of a man that Paul kicked out, said that should be kicked out the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul said this should not be. Paul was looking for them to be reconciled, the community to be reconciled with this person. Also, remember how we talked about there were all these like lawsuits that people were going after each other about in the early church there in Corinth? Paul says, now it's time to uh, reconcile about that. Also, Paul is seeking to um, show his authority because he is being challenged by all these false apostles. And he's also trying to address the need of those in Jerusalem who are suffering financially, who are struggling, and he wants to deal with the offerings. So uh, there are some textual issues. Some people think that uh, maybe the end of the letter is actually the beginning part of the letter, and we're not exactly sure uh, what completely motivates. Uh, we know some topics. We don't exactly know why Paul would write this second letter. Um, and let's get started. So 
as Paul gets started, um, here we go. As Paul gets started in his first chapter, he begins to talk about helping us understand the role of suffering. So let's go there. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. So he begins to frame his whole conversation as, as God is the one who brings comfort, right? And uh, here's what Paul says, verse 4. God is the one who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, we, we ourselves receive. So what Paul's going to do is he's going to say that God has comforted us so that we can comfort other people. And as we go through trials, as we go through great suffering, God is with us, God is providing comfort, and that we then out of those sufferings can comfort other people. And this helps Paul deal with his own suffering, because here he is traveling around the world, bringing this message, uh, being beaten and arrested, threatened with his life. Uh, people are turning their backs on him. And one of the questions is like, why would God allow all this to happen? Paul never comes up with an answer with that. But what he does say is what he realizes is that, is that God is meeting him in that. And out of all that he has received, all the comfort that he has received, he can now connect with people and provide comfort in different ways, in better ways, more full ways because of his suffering. His suffering is allowing him to fully identify, fully connect, fully um, engage with other people who are suffering. And in this, then, his suffering is also opening up this avenue in his own heart to fully understand weakness so that God's power is made known in him. It's not operating in his own strength, but operating out of God's power. Now, why this is so significant is rather than Paul simply seeing his suffering as standing alone by itself, pointless, he now has this communal focus and says, even though I'm suffering in all these painful ways, this can help the community. Others can be helped out of my suffering. So I think about a person I know pretty well who has been suffering with fourth stage cancer for four years, and their body has been uh, having some difficulties of recent, and they're going through these experimental trials. And I asked this person, why would you go through all these trials if this is causing such suffering to you? And they said, but if somebody else can be benefited by what's learned in this trial, it makes it all worth it. I just want to help somebody else. You see, it's exactly what Paul is saying in his own role of suffering. So as Paul goes along, one of the sufferings that he's encountering is that people are questioning whether he should be um, the leader anymore, whether he should be seen as a voice of God, whether he should be seen as an authority, particularly whether he should be seen as a quote unquote apostle. And Paul argues and he says, you know, I'm leading in this way, not because I'm trying to get money, but because God has been made known to me and that, that God has given him. God is the one who has called him, and God is the one who has given him his competency. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, um, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competency comes from God. That our competency comes from God. And he then argues that he's being transformed out of his suffering, out of these questions, he's being transformed into greater glory, uh, even though Satan is seeking to blind the eyes of the people around him. And Paul then talks about this new covenant. And we mentioned this idea of covenants uh, when we talked about the book of Romans. Paul was going to lift this up again, and he's going to compare what God is doing now in Christ and the Holy Spirit in relationship to what God did with the Ten Commandments. And Paul says, you know, the old one, the old covenant was written on the tablets of stone. Now God's Spirit is writing it on the human heart. This old covenant... Um, exposed to us our sin, exposed to us the ways that we've broken the law and in the ways that we deserve to die. Um, but now in this spirit, uh, this new covenant of the spirit, that God is bringing about righteousness. Uh, this old covenant is fading away, and this new covenant is abiding with us. So another thing that Paul says in his text, this is 
2 Corinthians chapter 4. Again, cloaking or covering all this, not cloaking, but covering all of this in the, the idea of suffering. Paul talks about what's happening to him. And he says um, why he doesn't lose heart because he has been suffering intensely. So look at verse seven of chapter four. He says, we have this treasure, this treasure meaning this, the, the, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the, the gifts of God. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What Paul says is that God has given us so many beautiful things, yet it's contained in this fragile, um, depleting, cracked vessel. It's a clay jar. You know how tender a clay jar can be. Drop it on the floor and it's going to shatter. Paul begins to use this idea of a clay jar or an earthen vessel for the human body. And he says, this is verse eight. We are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. Per perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in us. And what he's saying is, is that although he is... Um, suffering every day and his body is being crushed and his body is being weakened yet he's gaining strength he's gaining power because he knows that his his suffering is is only momentary let's go down here to verse 16 of chapter 4 therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly that human body we are wasting away inwardly however we are being renewed but day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is seen is eternal. This idea that although his body is breaking down from all the suffering, he is investing in these eternal values. And the other thing he says, I think is really important, is that his suffering is momentary or temporary. Now, one of the things that you and I probably have experienced is that when we're suffering, it feels like it's never, ever, ever going to end. And it hurts so bad and the hurting is never going to stop. But yet Paul says that's not actually true because in light of what he knows about Christ and the Holy Spirit, there is greater glory that's coming and the suffering is limited. And then if you look at the first part of chapter five, Paul then says, he compares all of this with this idea of um, the body, which is wasting away, but will be clothed in immortality soon. All of this, this temporary suffering will be swallowed up by eternal glory. These uh, physical limitations and crushings uh, will be swallowed up by, by immortality or foreverness. So the truth is your body isn't a wonderland per se, but your body is a clay jar. And at times it's going to go through suffering that is temporary because God is putting inside of this clay jar God's eternal glorious spirit, which will continue to grow and nurture. And as your body gets weaker, the power of God becomes stronger in you. Now, in chapter five, Paul begins to address the idea of reconciliation. Why is he doing what he's doing? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and um, looking at verse 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others what, is, uh, what we are as plain to God and I hope is also plain to you. Um, he goes on and says, verse 13, if we're out of our minds, it's for God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, therefore all have died. So what he's saying is that he is so being driven by the love of Christ to begin to, begin to go out into the world and to share this truth because Christ has died for all. Now, what does this mean? Look at verse 16. So now we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. 
The old has gone. The new is here. All of this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and now has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, reconciliation is probably not a word we use much, but here's what it means. Reconciliation happens between two peoples, two parties, two organizations, two countries, two warring fac factions. So it doesn't have to mean like physical war. It could be war of words, war of aggression, hatred, two opposite groups, Democrats, Republicans, um, you know, maybe you and one of your parents, um, Ukraine and Russia, these warring groups. And the Ministry of Reconciliation is, what do we do? What do we need to do to get these two groups to talk and to relate together again, right? What's it going to take to reconcile? Well, the parties that, that Paul is talking about is God and humanity. There has been a massive fracture, sin, right? Distrust, rebellion. Humanity has sinned, distrusted God, turned, turned their back on God, and has rebelled against God. Active rebellion. They have become the enemy of God. And is there any hope of humanity reconciling to God? Well, humanity hasn't changed. Humanity is not turning its face towards God. So what needs to happen? Paul argues that God has made the first move. God has taken flesh and become Christ. God has engaged in the world, and the world killed Jesus. God raises Jesus from the dead to bring love to the earth, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So God has brought this message of reconciliation, saying that I no longer want war with you. I am not your enemy. I want peace. I lay it all down for you. So Paul says this idea, this ministry of reconciliation, the idea of making peace, um, is you're not holding, God is not holding the sins of the world against them. God is not holding the sins of humanity against them. God is seeking now to make peace. And Paul sees himself as that ambassador, that God is not against you, God is for you. God longs to be with you and in relationship with you. And, and here's the path that God has laid out for reconciliation. Move forward in this way. This is the, if we ever want to understand the heart and soul of the Apostle Paul, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11 through verse 21, the idea that we are being brought into Christ. Now, later on, one of the questions that we often have is that um, why are churches always asking for money? If you look on religious television, they're always asking for money. Why do churches want money? That's a really great question, an honest question. Why do churches deal with money anyways? Well, in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul spends a whole chapter, 8 and 9, talking about the ministry of generosity and giving. Now, let's look at the historical context. Paul has been traveling, and as he's been planting these churches and building up, he has been taking money up for the poorest, uh, which is the church in Jerusalem. So the, that would be like the equivalent of me today as I go out from church to church to church, that maybe I'm raising money for the believers in Haiti or South Sudan, Afghanistan, North Korea, some of the most poor places on earth, right? So I'm raising money for that. And what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 8 is that our, our giving must be voluntary and filled with joy because it's a way for us, people who are giving, to share in God's ministry, to share in what God is doing. We give because it's another way to honor God and to participate in what God longs for. So maybe God doesn't care about keeping the lights on at the church. But does God care about feeding the hungry, which is what this church does, right? Paul also says that giving is a sign of love. Now, let's look down in what says uh, verse 7, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. And in verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, here is like the heart and soul of, about giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty, 
he might make you rich. What that means is that Christ has given up heaven and taken up flesh and dwelt among us so that we can experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, mercy, and self-control, and that we can also experience the glories of heaven. So our modeling, we should give as a sign of our appreciation and gratitude to what Christ has given us. We give because God has given to us first. So if you've given me a dozen apples and I go out and I give three apples away um, to other people around me, I'm doing that because I'm just so grateful for what you have given me. I'm just so grateful to have these dozen apples, but now I give out multiple apples to people in need because I'm just so thankful, right? And then Paul also argues that there really is a, a blessing that comes with generosity, right? Um, verse, this is 2 Corinthians 9, 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God, right? So this idea that this, you're not only taking care of the people in front of you, but also this is blessing the heart of God. Now, later in Paul's um, writing here, he actively, actively defends himself against the people who are challenging him and calling him a false apostle. And finally, what he has to say is, look at my life. I am crushed in weakness, but God is doing something powerful. And again, this is kind of like the argument he made in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you really want to be an apostle, here's the path of suffering. It's not all this victory, but it's really about suffering, right? And uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Let's talk about that real quick. Paul then says, 2 Corinthians 12, I must go on on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to now visions and revelations from the Lord. What happens is these leaders who are challenging Paul's leadership were claiming this like super spirituality, how close they are to God, and you know, how much they know about the apostles teaching and yada, yada, yada. And Paul says, okay, but if we have to start boasting and if we have to start talking about things, I'm going to go on now to visions and revelations. Let's talk about that more than just head knowledge. What has God made known to you? So let's talk about second Corinthians 12 verse two. Paul then says, I know a man who in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Only God knows. Now, this right here, we're like, er, third heaven, what are you talking about? Paul, being an ancient first century Jew, had a different cosmology than we do, meaning he, uh, the understanding of the universe, right? So for Paul, the first heaven was kind of like the, the, the clouds, the, 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 the animals that fly, the very thing that we can see. And the second heaven was like the sun and the moon and the stars, kind of what we call outer space. And the third heaven is this mystical place where God alone dwells. It's the dwelling place of God. So when Paul says the third heaven, what he says is he knows a man who has been taken to this third heaven and has seen things. Now, the question is, is this someone that Paul knows? Is this Paul himself? which would make most sense that why he would bring it up now. But is he trying to be so humble about it that he refers to it in third person? Bible scholars don't exactly know, but it sure seems like he's talking about himself. And here's what he says. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, only God knows, was caught up to the paradise. And he heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except the only thing I'm going to boast in is my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so that no one will think more of me than what's warranted by what I do or say because of these surpassing great revelations. Now he says this, even though I have been to the third heaven and even though I have seen things that I can't even express because they're so unbelievably amazing and holy and right and godlike but god has now done something verse 7 um therefore in order to keep me from becoming too conceited i was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of satan to torment me 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults and hardships and persecution and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. What Paul says is even though he's been taken to this third heaven, um, he has been given a thorn in his flesh. Something that Satan is using to crush him. What is this thorn in the flesh? We don't know. Bible scholars argue that it could be personal anxiety or spiritual torment. Um, some argue it could be a physical illness like migraines, malaria, epilepsy, an eye ailment that he clearly had, a speech impediment. Some people think that maybe this is just a metaphor for the persecution that he suffers. Some people have argued that maybe Paul suffered incredible temptation. He was a single man out there traveling for many months. Maybe he had sexual temptation. What, whatever it is, it was crushing him and keeping him so humble. And he asked God to relieve it. And God said, I'm not going to relieve this from you, but I'm going to give you my grace. You're going to have to wrestle with this but I'm going to give you my grace because my grace is sufficient. My grace will cover you. My grace will be enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So rather than challenging these false apostles and, and canceling them and going to battle against them, Paul simply um, boasts in all of his limitations and his weaknesses. Talk about how countercultural this is. And Paul finally says, this isn't his own experience also, but this is also the experience of Jesus, right? Um, look at 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13. This will be now my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I'm going to repeat it now while I'm absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or of any other things, since you're demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. Christ is not weak in dealing with you, but Christ is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives now by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him when we deal with you. So what Paul's arguing is that even Christ was crucified in utter weakness. But now that, that Christ has been raised, that there is power with it. There is an authority that comes with it. Um, but it's different than the type of authority that these false teachers are trying to bring. So today, as we, we explored 2 Corinthians, we explore the idea of what it means for uh, power in weakness and what, what it means for us to um, see our suffering, um, to know God's comfort in our suffering so that we can comfort other people.